Hi, my name is Daniel Blackburn, and today we're going to talk about vermicomposting in small and large scales, uh, vermifilter, and worm farming. Okay, so this lecture is part of the course Waste Management for Soil Applications, and today we're going to talk about vermicomposting systems. So what is vermicompost and uh, vermicomposting, and how does it compare to conventional composting, hot composting, and cold composting? Vermicomposting is uh, the use of the worms, uh, worm, uh, earthworms, to process and accelerate the decomposition of organic matter. And as you do that, the, the properties of these materials will change significantly. Yeah? So um, what, whenever you're using earthworms to process organic matter, this is what you call vermicomposting. And let's talk about um, the, the properties and how to manage this. So, what, what earthworms actually do in this, they are digesting, they're eating two things. Yeah, they're eating the microbes in the, in the compost and they are eating the, the very small particulate organic matter, very small particulate organic matter. So these are the two things the arms are eating. Yeah, so the, what, what happens through the digestive system of the worms is the microbes, specific microbial community in the guts of these microbes are uh, uh, degrading some organic matter and transforming that organic matter into humus. And also the, there's the two components, there's the earthworm uh, digestive system, the enzymes from the earthworm, and there are the enzymes that is coming from the microbes in the earthworm's gut. Um, so there is, there's a speculation of some grinding uh, uh, activity from the worms, although I would, I would uh, in my opinion, I don't think this is so significant since the worms will not ingest uh, uh, very large materials. They will only ingest the materials which are already somewhat at a very fine uh, uh, particle size. Yeah. Also, there's some mucus that is released from the, the, the worm into this material. This mucus also gives a little bit of different property. It becomes a little bit more hydrophobic, the type of material that is produced by the, the, the worms. And the worm castings are a little bit more hydrophobic than the normal compost is. <clears throat> so let's give it a, a, a quick comparison between composting and vermicomposting. The vermicomposting process is normally uh, achieved in 60 days, about 60 days, two months, uh, but can, can be as quick as uh, 30 days. Nevertheless, at 30 days, most likely the, 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 the percentage of uh, castings on the compost will be uh, smaller. If you leave it longer, up to 60 days, the percentage of castings on the final product will be higher. Uh, whereas compost, you can have usually minimum to two months, up to six months. Uh, uh, the vermicomposting, you want to perform that at the, temp at the temperature which the worms are more adapted to, which is normally between 15 and 25 Celsius. Uh, in hot composting, you have the thermophilic phase uh, happening. Uh, in the vermicompost, you do not need forced aeration. There are some systems that uh, have forced aeration, um, uh, but in the composting process, you want to turn mechanically that, that uh, uh, compost pile to uh, promote aeration in this process. In the vermicomposting, you assume that the majority, over 50% of the final material is uh, warm castings. It means that it passed it, it pass it through the digest, digestive system of the worms, uh, whereas um, in, the, in the case uh, of the composting is only micro, a microbial process, or exclusively a microbial process. 
um, the, the, the microbial community during the vermicompost is a stable microbial community. It, it means that over time it sustains the same uh, microbial community, whereas for uh, the conventional composting, there is a microbial succession. And you know, there's a succession of a microbial community which is happening from, depending on the carbon transformations and the temperature and the pH on that material, the type of microbial community will be specific for each phase, whereas for the vermicomposting is just a continuous effect of the same microbial community, which is happening. Yeah? Uh, the price of vermicompost, because of its fertility, there's a higher fertility on this material. So the price, it's at least five times higher. Normally it sells five times higher and it's highly appreciated on the, the, the countries and in the communities that know about this uh, type of material. People value that a lot. It works like magic for your uh, indoor plants. The, the vigor that you get on your plants with, indoor, uh, with vermicomposting is much, much higher than you get with normal compost. And that is one of the reasons why it has a, a premium price over it. Yeah? Uh, in terms of plagues, if, you if you're using this vermicompost outside, I have seen before uh, attracted rodents and they may eat the worms. Also, some frogs may eat the worms. Uh, but also, this is not exclusive from vermicomposting. Compost, you may have also, depending on the type of feedstock that you use, you may have rodent product, product problems also. So you, you need to manage, uh, if you're doing it in, in large scale or outside, you need to manage rodents anyway from both systems. Uh, in vermicompost fruit flies, it can be a problem, uh, but also uh, uh, this is a problem from, from even from soils and also from compost. Also flies, other flies are attracted to normal composting, whereas for vermicompost is more fruit flies than uh, uh, normal flies, maggot flies. Yeah? Um, so the fertility, as I was saying, there's, it's much, uh, the fertility is much higher in the, in the vermicompost than it is in the compost. And uh, th there is some, some difference in the hydrophobicity of this material. So it's, uh, uh, you, can, you can mix it a lower percentage when you're using it in your pot mixture uh, to avoid having hydrophobicity problems. Uh, there is a problem here with vermicompost this, it, because it does not have the thermophilic phase, it, it does not eliminate seeds. So this, this is another advantage of composting. But you can circumvent this, I will tell you, in industrial systems by using a pre-composting of the material. So uh, the other thing we need to uh, separate is that, uh, that there is a difference between uh, Vermicomposting and vermiculture. Yeah, vermiculture is the process where you are uh, producing worms. And the, 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 normally these vermiculture systems, they are uh, they're almost not concerned about uh, the, the compost itself or the organic material. They are concerned in producing a high amount of worms and uh, uh, increasing the bio biomass of these worms in, in the systems. And uh, the, 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 there's a lot of care and more, uh, uh, you spend more money on feeding the worms exactly what you think it's the, the most appropriate composition of the feed to fatten these worms. Uh, the, the main markets for this are the, the, the households and, and people who are buying worms for their vermicomposting, but also the people who are buying this for fishing. So when you're targeting the fishing uh, market, you are looking in um, uh, trying to use mainly worms that will grow for a significant size. And there is a preference for the uh, Dendrobiana uh, veneta in this case, which is a synonym for the Isenia hortensis worms. Uh, the, these, these systems, there are people also, they are uh, dedicated as making uh, alternative sources of, of um, revenues from these systems, uh, which can be also books, training, videos, uh, uh, and etc. Uh, but this is uh, normally 
small scale systems uh, with, reg with regards to vermicomposting. We will focus uh, on our course in vermicomposting because we are looking into recycling of organic waste for soil applications. So the, the, the um, vermiculture, the preferred uh, species is European night crawler. Uh, you can have that these worms, if you uh, have a very uh, specific conditions, you can grow these worms to large size, as you see here on this photograph. And these large size uh, European night crawlers are highly valued for fishing activities. So what you do for uh, fattening up these worms uh, up to this stage, is to increase the rotation. You have three to four weeks, uh, changing the substrate every three to four weeks separate, in order to separate these worms from the babies and from the, the cocoons. Uh, you add worm chow or uh, chicken uh, feed, uh, lime, sand grit, uh, and um, peat moss is the, the preferred uh, mixture for this type of activities. And then by changing the substrate, and in and, and the uh, adding uh, feed uh, from uh, either worm chow or uh, chicken uh, feed, this will help the worms to gain weight very quickly. And, uh, and you end up with this uh, type of worms which are overgrown and uh, appreciated for fishing markets. So what earthworms do we use in vermicompost? Not these that you see on the photo photograph. There are approximately uh, 9,000 species of earthworms, and some of them are quite big. You can see here David, David Attenborough, a, a classic documentary and BBC showing in Australia. Uh, Australia, these uh, uh, gigantic worms, but you can see other photographs here, which is uh, show even bigger ones. And uh, the, 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 the earthworms are uh, Anelida from the film Anelida, and most of them are from the family Lombricidae. And I will show you here in a bit the main compost worms. I, I, I made a video about separating and identified, identifying these worms before, and I will link the video here uh, for you. But I will quickly show you which are the worms that are commonly used for composting. They are hermaphrodites. Uh, it means that they do not have a defined sex. They are both male and female. They are able to uh, uh, have cross fecundation or fertilization, uh, or they can self fertilize. Yeah? They can, they can, uh, if you have only one earthworm, they can still produce an offspring. But if you do that in the long term, that will decrease the, the, the viability of. The, the, in the fertility of this population. Uh, the, 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 the mouth or prostomium is where the, 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 the microbes, the microbial biomass is ingested. The, the action of these earthworms is sort of, uh, it's, it is the action of a grazer, a microbial grazer. It will eat microbial biomass and will digest the microbial biomass and then uh, uh, through its digestive system, and during this process, they will have a gut microbiome, which is specific colonizing inside the, the, the guts of these earthworms. And uh, then uh, this, is, this is what they eat normally. And small particulated organic matter also will be digested by these microbes. So there is a, a, a the, if, if you have grit on this system, it means something, some uh, uh, soil particles or uh, solid particles that will help this digestion because it will help to break down the cell walls for, from these microbes. Um, these, micro, these earthworms are photosensitive. It means they will escape light always. Um, the, the, the reproduction of these earthworms are through cocoons, which are a bag of eggs. And these eggs, the amount of eggs in each cocoon will vary uh, in the viability of these eggs per cocoon will vary depending on the species. Um, they don't have lungs, they breathe through their skins uh, and uh, the skin needs to be moist all the time. If the skin dries out, the earthworm will die. So, yeah. The earthworm, there is, there is a, a, a asymmetry on the earthworm anatomy. It means that worm has a head and a tail. It doesn't, it, 
it it always in, it's always ingesting feed through the head and secreting it uh, through the tail um, uh, to the later end of the worm. Um, uh, the, there is a reproductive structure which is called the, the clitellum or saddle, where it's located the, the, the female pores, which is called tuberculous pubertatis. And late, uh, depending on the worm species, the, the location of this clitellum will be uh, closer to the head or further down, and the male pores can be close by here or further apart, depending on the species. And you can identify this worm species. Um, based on the position of the clitellum and uh, the male pore. All right. So how do they reproduce? They uh, they bind. If if it's a cross uh, fecundation, they bind the male pore with the clitellum, simultaneously uh, fertilizing the two specimens at the same time as you see here. And as they bind here, they, they transfer uh, these uh, um, gametes into each other. After that, um, a few days later, they will this clitellum will form a bag, and this bag will be secreted as a cocoon. This is what the cocoons look like here on the bottom. And uh, two, uh, three weeks later, up to two months later, this... Uh, cocoons will be eclosing, the eggs inside the cocoons will be eclosing in the worms, the baby worms will come out, as you see here in these photographs, and uh, it will take about two months to be sexually mature and about up to six months to be uh, to become a full-size worm later on. The, the, the main worm species that are used for vermicomposting are the commonly called red wigglers. The red wigglers, there are two species. Uh, these two species are uh, similar to each other. There's very little difference morphologically. Uh, the Isenia fetida uh, is um, it's very striped. And the Isenia andrei, uh, it's less striped. It's more a solid red color. These two species, uh, they, they can form hybrids. And you don't want them to form hybrids because the offspring from these two species is less fertile than if you have the population isolated. So either one of those can be combined and may form uh, mixed populations with other worm species, but when they are combined together, they, the fertility of this, uh, the offspring is decreased. So you don't want to mix these two species. Between Fetida and Andre, Andre is preferred because it has a, a higher fertility. It multiplies and, uh, and uh, increase the population quicker than Isenia fetida. But as, as a habit of consuming the organic waste, they, are, they have a sim similar habit. The, the, the ability of processing waste, both of them are, have a very high ability of processing organic waste. So uh, either of them can be used, just be careful, try not to have a mixed culture of those. Yeah? Uh, the temperature they, that they can uh, uh, work is normally up to 33 Celsius, ideally around 25 Celsius. 25 is the, the ideal condition for them, but over 33, they will start dying, which means this is a problem for here in Oman. If you're doing this uh, vermicomposting outside, you have the problem of ex extreme heats on the summer. Uh, the size is almost never reaching 10 centimeters, around 5 to 7 centimeters is the, the, the usual size you get from these worms. Occasionally you will find bigger ones, but uh, uh, the, 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 if, you find, if you find very big uh, species, uh, specimens that look like the Isenia fetida, normally they will be European nightcrawler, not Isenia fetida. They have a similar aspect, but they are bigger worms, fatter worms. This is how uh, Isenia fetida looks like. It's a uh, uh, very striped worm um, and uh, the Isenia andre is a more solid color. Both of them will have a yellow tail. So this is a, a, a tail sign of that you have uh, Isenia species. 
So Asenia is, uh, uh the preferred species for uh, vermicomposting, uh, or Asenia andrei, as I said, as I said before. So you don't want to mix them. Um, the, the, just giving a, a fact sheet about these worms again. The cocoon is laid two days after copulation. The incubation period of the cocoon is uh, from 18 days up to 26 days, but I find that you can have viable cocoons even three months later. Um, normally, in a senior fetida, you have around three hatchings per cocoon, up to five hatchings per cocoon. And in a senior andre, you may have up to 12 hatchings per cocoon. Uh, they are sex sexually mature about one month after uh, eclosing from the eggs. Uh, the adult size it will be reached around six months after uh, eclosing. The life ex expectancy is uh, up, up to five years uh, from an individual. So uh, adult species, uh, if you buy very big specimens, they're probably a couple of years old and uh, the, the life expectancy from those will be limited also. Uh, the, the, the moisture content of the substrate they need is around 80% ideal, ideally, uh, but between 60 and 80% very moist material, that's what you want. Below 60%, they will start, um, uh, they will not like too much. And the, but you don't want also, moisture is so high that the compost becomes anaerobic. Yeah? The, these worms, they tend to buffer the pH of the, the vermicompost to pH 7, and uh, but they can tolerate between 5 and 9, depending on the type of bedding that you're adding and the type of feed that you're adding to the worms. This, uh, the, this vermicompost can become very acidic, but uh, if it becomes too acidic, they will try to escape that, that environment, but between five and nine, they will tolerate fine. Yeah? The other things that are uh, problem, problematic for, for, uh, for the worms are high concentration of ammonium nitrate and the salinity of this uh, material is also can be problematic if the salinity is very high. Uh, the, the, the rate of consumption of the material is between 25 and 35 percent of the, the mass, the biomass of the worms. 25 percent of that biomass per day is what you should expect. Uh, although this is being a little bit optimistic, yeah, this is a little bit optimistic. Okay. Next worm species that is commonly used is the Dendrobaena veneta. The Dorbaena veneta is um, uh, the, the, what, the, what normally is referred as European night crawlers, the one that you see here on the photographs. They are very similar morphologically and visually to the Asenia fetida. Nevertheless, they can grow much larger and they can become very, uh, very thick worms also. Um, the Dendrobaena hortensis is normally, uh, people are normally referring that as the European night, night crawlers, but they are different species. And the most common species that you find, the Dendrobaena hortensis is not as big as the Dendrobaena veneta. And normally what, what people call uh, uh, Dendrobaena hortensis or Asenia hortensis is actually Dendrobaena veneta. Um, this is the species that is commonly used for uh, fish markets and uh, vermiculture, yeah, mostly in, uh, than uh, vermicomposting. Other, uh, other worm species that can be used for composting uh, uh, is Lumbricus rubellus. Uh, what you want to take care of when you use Lumbricus rubellus is that you want deeper materials. Yeah? The, 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 your box should have a, a thicker layer of, of bedding for these species, and they will be able to compost well. Uh, Alabama jumper or Amita gracilis is also uh, used quite a bit for uh, composting. This is a, a quite avid composter and it's a big worm. Uh, uh, nevertheless, it's a very invasive worm at the same time. This is an Asian worm uh, coming from China, and it's, it's already uh, colonized a lot of environments in North America in Central America. So you, um, if you use this worm, you, would, you uh, please try to avoid releasing that into the environment because it's a very invasive worm. The, the movement is this, of this worm is very characteristic. 
uh, it's a snake snake like movement so you um, it's not it's not hard to identify this worm the clitellum is not bulging and it's closer to the the head than you have in Asenia species uh, Eudrilus eugeni or African night crawlers, uh, the common name also uh, commonly used uh, and are also very good composters. Uh, also, the, the clitellum is closer to the head. You have this um, uh, uh, characteristic color, darker uh, uh, purple sheen that you have on this. Um, but it's also a, a viable species for using in composting. The other one is uh, normally the the when when you buy uh, um, Asenia fetida cultures, you might have a, a mixture of Asenia and also blue worms. Uh, these are Pe Perionyx excavatus, uh, and these blue worms uh, or Indian worms or Indian blue worms. These are uh, also good composters. If you have pure cultures of those. This is also fine. This is easier to separate. The clitellum is not bulging. Uh, the male pores are uh, uh, together with the, the clitellum. They're not far away down, down, uh, down uh, towards the head. And uh, just using this uh, general color aspect, the, the, the non-bulging clitellum in the shape of the male pore uh, together with the clitellum is easier to separate those. Only by looking, you would know right away that this is different from the, the Asenia species. They don't have a yellow tail, for example. It will be easier to separate. So it's, it's a common complaint in Facebook that uh, the, 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 the sales of uh, red wigglers are coming mixed with uh, blue worms in USA. But it's fine. These are good worms, underrated worms. These are good worms for composting. And... If you're looking, uh, and they do, they're not um, cross-fertilizing with the senior species, so there is not a lack of, of fertility on the offspring because of this. So it's it's okay to use uh, mixed cultures of Asenia and Perionyx species. So why do it? Why do vermicompost at small scale? Yeah, the vermicompost at small scales are uh, or Great, yeah, they're great. They are great ways of uh, environmental education. You can see here uh, 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 a recent uh, article that was shared in, in Facebook, uh, Facebook groups. There are very useful Facebook groups for you if you want to uh, contact the communities on this uh, subject. And um, these, these, uh, Indoors or outdoors vermicompost in small scales, they're great for uh, waste diversion. It means that you are generating less waste and uh, these organic wastes are not going for, uh, for the, the landfills. Also, the, it's, it's a fun activity. Yeah? If you have worms, the, the worms make for great pets. You, every, everybody that has worms, they're fascinated by worms. It's a... There's a lot of fun involved on keeping worms at your home and recycling using worms. At the same time, you produce the best type, the, the top quality of organic fertilizers, the best that you could, that you could ever produce are uh, done by, by, by worms. Yeah, if you, the, the best organic compost that you can make is the one made with uh, worm composting. The other advantage is that it is a, an activity that can be done indoors if you have an apartment or if you live in a house or if you live in a harsh climate that has a very uh, uh, cold winters or very hot summers like here in Oman. These activities can be done indoors in, in, in beans and this is fine and it's, there's no smell associated and uh, there's a great advantage by, by doing this. So vermicompost at a small scale it, there's a, there's a, um, a great advantage of doing this because of these this, uh, factors that I just mentioned. How do you do this? Yeah, any container, any bean is, uh, that you have will be enough for uh, doing this at small scale 
at home, at the school, at the small business, any container will do, plastic containers that you see here are the most common ones that you see, but you can adapt almost anything. What you want to do is prioritize that the, the, it's more a shallow material, not a very deep material. So the normal compost beans that you see on the market, they are very uh, large and high. Uh, so these are not the most appropriate for vermicompost. What you want for vermicompost is something that you will keep uh, 20 to 40 centimeters maximum of material. Um, and you can adapt almost anything for using this. Yeah? So, so let's look at how to manage this. You can do also in raised beds directly on the soil. The, the only disadvantage of this is that you will have a higher likelihood that the worms will be escaping when the conditions are not right. But this can be done also, and you can scale up in schools or, or any, any patio just by doing raised, worm, uh, raised beds. But in the result, there are loads of commercial uh, setups for uh, worm composting at home. And these setups are, some of them I, uh, I like, like the hungry bean that you see here. Some others are not so, actually so advantageous, like the one you have here on, on the right. Uh, but actually just, if you have just a simple container, that's enough. If you don't <coughs> overwater these containers, you will not have a problem of uh, uh, saturation. If you don't, if you don't overfeed these containers, you don't have, you will not have any problem at all. Always use an excess uh, of bedding uh, the more you can. In every two months, you can change that bedding, harvest your vermicompost, and you will, by doing this, you will have um, a healthy vermicompost system at your home. So, how does it work? This system here, uh, on the on the on the right, on the left here, is that. This is a continuous flow system. You harvest from the bottom and you're adding your material on the top. Yeah? So as you add your material, this uh, when this is full, the material on the bottom will be completely composted. So you can open here the, the, this uh, gate on the, on the bottom and harvest your material on the bottom. Uh, the other type of system that is commonly used for uh, Home compost is like warm towers, like you have, have this one here. And you can make, of course, these warm towers by yourself, just by stacking beans on top of each other. The lower bean is normally to collect leachates. Um, in my opinion, this is really not needed. If you manage well, well the moisture of your containers, you do not need to collect leachates. Uh, this this leachate can be even a source of some bad smells at your home, so I don't think it's the most appropriate way of doing it. Just avoid uh, over uh, irrigating or um, overfeeding your material. It's always add some some amount of dry bedding, so it will, you will always be able to avoid generating leachates by doing this. So the, 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 the different systems, uh, the, 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 the simple bean system that I showed before, like here, um, the, or this uh, continuous flow system where you harvest from the bottom, or the warm towers, these are based mainly on the, the necessity that you have for uh, separating the worms from the compost when you're harvesting the material. If you have like this system as a continuous flow, the worms will be staying on the top where the food or the feed is, and the, the compost on the bottom will be without worms. But nevertheless, the compost on the bottom will contain a lot of cocoons. Yeah? Um, so this system you can, if you do it like that, never, I, I still find a little bit difficult to remove the compost from the bottom of systems like this. But anyway, it, uh, uh, the majority of the users of systems like this are very happy with the, with the setup. The other type of setup is the, 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 the warm towers. The warm towers, it means that you are, uh, when you have your compost ready, you will add the top trail the, as a working bin. You will add the, the bedding and the food on the top trail. And this bin on the bottom, this, the worms will slowly migrate towards the bin on the top. 
and then when they migrate to, towards the bean on the top, you can remove the curing bean and harvest the curing bean. So it's a vertical migrations. The worms are uh, going up upwards here in these systems. So some uh, important things that you need to take care of when you're looking into small scale uh, bedding systems. And this is also, uh, you can, uh, upscale this if you want uh, for industrial systems but there are there are some adaptations there can be used some, some cannot yeah but some things you need to take care of when you're looking into your indoor or outdoor small scale uh, worm farming is first of all bedding what we mean by what we mean by bedding is the the, the high carbon to nitrogen substrates yeah paper shredded paper, shredded cardboard, leaves, uh, also um, manures and compost, they are, they are working as bedding and as feed at the same time. You know, they're already a balanced carbon to nitrogen ratio. So uh, paper, cardboard and leaves are more considered as bedding, whereas manures and feed, they have the double purpose of being bedding and feed at the same time. What we mean by feed is like the kitchen waste, uh, food scraps, uh, food waste, coffee grounds, ma manures, uh, fresh plant residues. Uh, this is what we mean by 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 the the, the the feed. Yeah, but what you should avoid as a feed is something that it will generate heat. Anything that you add in uh, that will generate heat, you should add in low amounts. Uh, and uh, spicy foods or acid foods that has, for example, um, um, vinegar or, or something, anything acid will be, uh, or pickles will be bad for the worms. They would not like it. Citrus for the same reason. Onions and garlic also the, the worms will not like this. So if, you're, if you know that you have some things that the worms do not like it, you can separate them and add it to the cold composting instead of adding for the, 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 the warm meats. Uh, other things, when you separate in your kitchen waste and your food waste, you keep the napkins together and this will, the worms will eat them uh, very swiftly. You're already balancing the carbon to nitrogen ratio from these materials also. The, uh, you need to take care of the aeration. The main ways of you taking care of the aeration of the system is keeping the material shallow. So if you have a very deep materials, the oxygen concentration on the, on the lower parts of the bean will be uh, lower. You, you will build up CO2 in the lower parts. So keep this material shallow. Um, avoid using lids. If you use the lid, that will start concentrating CO2, methane inside the, the bean. Uh, and always work in unsaturated conditions. If you add too much water, over 80%, you will have problem with aeration. Temperatures, you want temperatures which are not extremely hot nor extremely cold. The, the worms can withstand 35 degrees for a short period of, period of time. They can withstand near freezing temperatures for short periods of time. Nevertheless, if you uh, overexpose them to extreme temperatures, you will kill the worms. So the temperatures are important to be taken care of. Or if you if you have a cold climate, if you're in a cold climate, is uh, you can enter your beans into the garage or indoors for a little bit when you have those uh, very cold uh, uh, weathers. In in Oman, also the same thing when you have. Uh, very hot weathers, you need to take care that uh, the, you, you will not uh, overheat your beans. Moisture, not too wet, not too dry. So it means you're looking in between 60 and 80% uh, moisture. So it's a more towards the wet end, but not uh, uh, too wet also. Uh, pH, if you have a, a very old beans that you are not harvesting the, the compost, this will tend to be acidified in time. So you can add some lime or ash, ash materials to uh, rebalance that uh, pH up. Grit is something that is always recommended online, but uh, you don't actually really need to add because almost all the materials that you use will have some amount of uh, silica, soil, or 
you know, some, some hard material that will help the worms in these situations. And even without grit, the worms will be able to uh, digest the material also. The grit will help, but the, it's not really needed. It's not necessary if, you're not, if you don't want to do it. The most common uh, grit that is recommended online for uh, households is uh, uh, crushed eggshells. Yeah? Crushed eggshells. So how, how do you do this, this system? You will start with 15 to 20 centimeters uh, bedding uh, that can be uh, pit moss, um, cardboard, uh, compost, shredded paper, or a mixture of those. And you will add a, approximately 2,000 worms per, per uh, square meter, or, or it means about 1,000 worms per bean like this, one bean like half a square meter like this, this size, you will add about 1,000 worms, or, or between 500 and 100, uh, oh, not 10,000 here, 1,000 cocoons per square meter, yeah? And this will be enough for starting your system. So when you start your system, wait a few weeks, wait one or two weeks to start feeding, to add your kitchen waste. So let the worms adapt to that uh, bedding when they are uh, really at home and they are already started to degrade some of that high carbon material, then you start feeding the worms only after that. Yeah? Always wait until the last feeding is done until you add the next feed or you can rotate if you have a big bean like this you can feed in one side and then the next week you will feed on the other side so in two weeks later when you come for this side the feed will be fully uh, uh, degraded uh, and you will not see any uh, residues of the feed ideally when you're feeding the worms use also um, some grit and some bedding uh, to, to in, the, in the, the position of where you're feeding and also ideally cover the, the, the feeding spot, dig a little bit the, the, the bedding, add your feed and cover again at the end. So uh, the top layer of this uh, system, uh, ideally you should have at least a five centime centimeters layer of bedding, uh, dry bedding, to avoid uh, fruit flies. Um, you can add a, 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 in the top of it a, a less sheet of one a newspaper or a card, cardboard to avoid uh, over drying the systems. Yeah. So at the time that the initial bedding is finished, uh, that is the correct time that you want to harvest your vermicompost. When you see no residues of your initial bedding, or almost no residues, you can harvest that bean. When every, the initial bed has bedding has become castings of the worms, that's when you want to harvest your uh, vermicompost. So the harvesting is done either by vertical migration or horizontal migration, or you can just sieve directly and hand separate your, your worms. What is uh, actually meant by vertical migration is you will add substrate with the, with, the, with the feed and the worms will concentrate where the substrate and the feed are and then you can uh, harvest the other part where uh, the material is left. So you have, if you have a bean like this, there are systems where you have two containers inside the bean uh, and then you can do uh, one with the new feed and one with the old and then the worms will tend to migrate for one side. If you have raised beds also, you can do the same thing. Let, leave it the, the old material to dry a little bit, add the moist material with uh, fresh food. The worms will slowly migrate to the new material and then you can harvest the old one. In the vertical system like this, as you're always adding uh, on the top, the worms will be adding food feed on the top. The, the worms are concentrated on the top. And then the, when you harvest on the bottom, it's uh, separated from the worms. Uh, in these uh, uh, worm towers, you have stacking up of different containers and the top container will have the fresh material on the food. So you can uh, uh, remove the, the lower container for harvesting uh, when the, all the worms have migrated to the top containers. So vertical migration, the worms are seeking the food upwards 
uh, um, horizontal migration, it means the, the worms are migrating from one side to the bin to another, seeking the, the, the feed, you know, the, the fresh feed. Uh, how many beans? How much area do you need? Uh, in my experience, you need about for for fully recycling all the organic waste from one household with four people, four to five people, you need about two square meters of beans, uh, which means uh, in my situation about four uh, plastic beans. And the advantage is these are smaller ones. You can stack them up. I have one system like this and on the top I have another bean and on the bottom another one. So I have actually six beans, four small stacked up, stacked up like this as drawers. And um, this is enough for one household. Um, so it's also, it's already a myth that you don't need enough, uh, too much area. You, you, you actually need quite a bit of area to work with worms. It's not something that you can do it, uh, uh, but you can stack up, yeah? If you have small spaces, you can always stack up those systems and uh, uh, recycle indoors if you need. Otherwise, you can do it outside depending on the type of climate that you have available. Uh, so if, you, if you're using also uh, your garden waste, you will need more area than this. And if you are splitting your organic waste between the cold compost or hot compost and the vermicompost, you can use one bean or two beans yeah? and only give the worms the feed that they like the most. Otherwise, uh, about two square meters is enough for one household. Common problems that you have in small scale uh, vermicomposting systems. One is the worms can be escaping your beans. Uh, this is a very common problem. Uh, uh, this is usually because there is anaerobic conditions, overfeeding uh, or uh, buildup of nitrate uh, on, the, on the worm bean or acid pHs can be uh, related to worms escaping. Uh, protein poisoning or a uh, string of pearls uh, is uh, when the worms start fragmenting like this, they, they die because of this poisoning is usually associated with overfeeding. Fruit flies is one of the common problems from, from worm beans. Uh, this is on a pot, not in a worm bean, but this, I had this now now it's controlled in my house, but I had this for quite a few months. Uh, a lot of fruit flies, depending on the season, there's fruit flies be can become a problem. Um, uh, in household beans, the, the beans, the seeds are not uh, removed from the system. So you can have some a, a lot of germination of seeds on this. This might be appreciated or not, depending on, uh, on what are you using this for, but there's a lot of seed germination. You can just re, uh, uh, uproot those those seedlings and incorporate that into the into the substrate, and the worms will eat that as it starts to decompose. So it's actually not a problem. But this this is um, not a problem in my case. But some people don't like it uh, 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 and prefer hot composting to vermicompost because. Hot composting does remove seeds yeah, and sterilize the, the, the seeds in this situation. So these are the problems that you might have. Bad odors, this is usually because of overfeeding or the compost is too wet. The, if the worms are escaping, you can be uh, because of overfeeding, too wet, or the, the, the bean is too acidic. Uh, or if it's overpopulated, you might be doing everything right, but if it's overpopulated, then uh, that may, may be the, the reason why the, the worms are escaping your bean. Uh, if the worms died, it normally is uh, due to extreme uh, 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 temperatures, or if you have, uh, if you overfed your worms, and you, you, you cause protein poisoning, um, this can cause the, 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 the worms to die also. Too dry, you can, you can kill your worms by over drying them. Um, so protein poisoning is one of the reasons that, that the worms will die. And this is usually done by overfeeding. As you can see here, the majority of the, the problems that you have in, uh, in, in, that you may have in vermicomposting is due to overfeeding. So if you, are, if you manage right, the feeding process, 
you will it's a smooth smooth process you will have almost any problem i am guilty i've done this before i overfed my worms uh, and i've killed some of them uh, so uh, just be careful about this the overfeeding is the main the main problem fruit flies you can control them by having uh, uh, appropriate layer of dry cover on top of your uh, wet material and seeds germinating you cannot control this at all you just have to uproot and incorporate the, feed, the, the, the seeds germinating on your bean into the compost and then they will uh, they will be decomposed all right some myths and uh, common uh, misconceptions about uh, Warm composting. So some people think that uh, compost worms are not earthworms. Com compost worm species are earthworm species. They are earthworm species. Not all earthworm species will be suitable for vermicomposting, but uh, there's a few number, uh, there's uh, a small number of species that are suitable for vermicomposting, uh, but uh, Others that are not so suitable can be adapted. If you have a deeper substrate, you can have, uh, you can still use uh, other species of earthworms for uh, uh, vermicomposting. So there, are, I've seen many cases, uh, successful cases, of uh, 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 people adapting their systems for Canadian night crawlers, for example, of other uh, soil worms that uh, can also be able to compost uh, well in, uh, uh, in in composting environments. I used for quite a while uh, a species that I found here in Oman and they were doing quite well until I, uh, I, I overfed them and that was my problem. Also, uh, some the ones that are less adapted for warm composting, the species will tend to escape more those means. So if you want to avoid the, uh, these problems, it's ob obviously better if you work with the most common worm species for uh, compost, but that doesn't mean that those worm species are not soil species also. They will live in soil environments and they will do well in soil environments at the same time. Some people say that they are selling or having 100% pure castings. This is never the case. There's always a mixture. It's there. They're never pure castings. There's a mixture of compost, on um, cold compost, and and warm castings. The higher the percentage of castings, the more fertile the material would be. But it doesn't doesn't mean it is 100% casting. This is not true at all. This is a misconception. Warm tea and warm whey. There's a lot of conversation going about the, the produce, making warm tea and the leachates, which are usually called, called warm whey. Uh, warm whey I added to my garden before, no problem at all, does not harm the plants. It's not, uh, it's not something terrible if you use that on your plants. The, the leachates from warm beans is not, in general, in my experience, will not kill your plants or negatively influence your plants. Warm tea is, uh, in my opinion, out of purpose because uh, if you make your warm tea, you're actually depleting the nutrients from your uh, vermicompost and you're not going to throw that vermicompost away any, anyway. So what you want to do actually is if you use the solid material, the vermicompost direct, directly on your plants, the same nutrients, the same microbes uh, uh, will go into the, the soil system. The only reason why you want to make warm tea, which is just an uh, aeration and, and uh, of this uh, 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 of a suspension of vermicompost in water, the only reason you will do this is if you want to have a liquid fertilizer for applying on the leaves of your plants. Otherwise, uh, it's preferred just to use directly the the vermicompost. Uh, the, the quality of the vermicompost is not always the same. Yeah? The quality of the vermicompost, people say, oh, I have vermicompost, is great quality. But if you're making vermicompost from paper, it's not the same thing if you have a lot of kitchen waste involved or if you're making it from manures. The end quality of your vermicompost is directly related to the source material that you're using to feed your worms and for the bedding of your worms. So there's a huge difference on the 
outcome quality of your vermicomposting, which is related to what did you use to feed the worms. Grid eggshells. Uh, a lot of people swearing by this. You need to always use grid. You always use grid. If you do not use it, your worms will be doing just as well. So this is another myth. Uh, no, most likely you don't need it. If you do it, good for you. It's good. I do it also. It's not that I don't do it. it and um, but it's actually it will not uh, make you fail your vermicomposting if you don't do it. So grit is useful but not uh, indispensable. Yeah, grit is useful but not indispensable. Uh, other myth that you have is people there. There is a, a high satisfaction of seeing the worm balls. A huge population of worms, but overpopulated beans can be a problem also. The the, the worms have the natural instinct to migrate when the beans are overpopulated. So you don't want to have beans which are overpopulated. That symptom that you, you see this huge population of worms in your beans, it's very satisfying, it's very beautiful to see, but actually the, uh, you may have uh, worms escape in your bean because of this. So if you have an overpopulated bean, you might want to create, uh, split the bean and separate that into two beans in order to uh, have a, a more smooth process to avoid having problems of worms escaping. Maybe you're doing everything right, but you have an overpopulated bean, and this is not a good thing. You know, no, it's not something that uh, um, that that is helping your process. Yeah, actually, there's a there's a, a good equilibrium about 1,000, 2,000. Uh, worms per, per per bean that is enough. If you reach for 4,000, uh, uh, three to 4,000 worms per bean, that is likely to be an over, overpopulated bean. A bean, one bean of half a square meter approximately. Yeah? Uh, another myth is that uh, worm composting takes less space. I would say that than composting. Yeah? Normally, Warm composting, in my experience, takes about the same space as composting. The only advantage is that you can do it indoors, where composting you have you have to do it outdoors. So when it comes for the uh, hot climates, or if you live in apartments, uh, 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 the 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 vermicompost is preferred in this situation. Uh, so. All, uh, the, 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 the less meat is that the, the warm compost will not survive on the soil. They will survive on your soil and they may even displace in other native species if that's the case. So warm compost can be invasive species outside their natural ecosystem. They may recolonize uh, and, and even outcompete soil worms in those conditions so don't uh, don't believe when you hear that warm compost will not survive in soil they will all right all right so let's talk about um industrial scale yeah industrial scale vermicompost when you're using industrial scale vermicomposting the the great benefit of doing it at small scale at households at schools and small business is that this, this, uh, the, the compost that you generate, the, the waste that you generated is not being, uh, they do not be, need to be transported to landfills or recycling facilities. You're already reusing and recycling this waste at home. Nevertheless, if you have uh, some situations where uh, you have an industry that is generating a huge amount of uh, organic waste, like manures, for example, or sludge, or uh, even if you have like a sugarcane uh, uh, residue or etc., any organic residue at organic uh, industrial scales, you can use vermicomposting to process this at large scales. The most recommended uh, system that you have is those beds, the raised beds suspended like this, they're suspended from the soil. And why they're suspended is because you can harvest them as a continuous flow system from the bottom. Um, 
So this is what they look like here on the photographs. Let me explain a little bit more of how these work. Uh, what you want to do is with your, if you're using manures and your manures contain some amount of seeds, you can do a pre-composting of this material or any situation where your material will tend to heat up as a composting, you can do uh, um, a, a pre-composting as a windrow composting as you would actually do as I explained on the previous lectures. And when you reach that phase where the, the thermophilic phase is ending and this temperature is starting to go down, this is the, exactly the point where you can use this material directly on these uh, uh, raised beds. You can apply a layer of two to five centimeters of this material on the top of here once a week, and the worms will consume this right, right away really well. So even if it's a little bit hot because it's a thin layer on the top of the material, the, the temperature will equilibrate with the, with the air temperature. And because it's on, it is on the thermophilic phase, the worms will, the, the, this compost will have a high amount of microbial biomass. And this will be what the microbes most appreciate. They will eat the microbes on this system, on this uh, feed, and they will process it. And as you are harvesting from the bottom, the top layers are going down, you add new material on the top. Yeah? So let's see how is the harvesting of this material from the bottom. So these raised beds, they have like a mesh here, like you see here uh, on this, uh, on this uh, picture. Yeah? These raised beds, they have like a mesh on the bottom. So it's like they're suspended on, on thin air. And at the end of the raised beds, you have a motor which vibrates and moves those mesh uh, 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 sideways. And as you do that, the material falls from the raised bed into the bottom, as you see here on this uh, situation here. And so you can see here all the compost being uh, uh, taken from the bottom. So from the bottom, you can have either conveyor belts or, or uh, mechanized systems that you can remove those that vermicompost from the bottom. Because you are feeding on the top, the worms will stay on the top layer and the bottom will have very few worms that you can separate it later on by sieving. Yeah? So this is how these systems work. They, uh, you are continuously adding uh, uh, feed on the top, which is usually preferredly uh, pre-composted material. And uh, on the bottom, you're harvesting this uh, weekly or bi-weekly, uh, depending on, on the system. After you harvest this, there are more machinery involved in the, uh, the receiving to separate the, the worms and larger particles. Uh, and from the sieving, you have a drying process, uh, uh, industrial dryers like you have here, and the machinery associated for bagging the material in, in uh dispatching this for the market. But uh, so in, in industrial systems, you want to uh, have uh, machinery for handling the, the, the composting process as a raised bed systems. You will need machinery for harvesting, transporting, drying, and uh, uh, sieving this material and bagging this material. The next industrial system that you have using worms are vermi filters or lumbri filters or uh, vermi digesters. What are these? These are water treatment systems. Yeah? Water treatment systems where you use a layer of or, uh, organic material containing the worms. And as the water, the wastewater goes through this, this filter, the solid particles are retained on the filter and uh, and this, the worms will eat that. So actually the worms can live quite well if you have saturated conditions, if those saturated conditions are uh, uh, still aerobic. If the water is coming with some oxygen level, the worms will still be able to survive in saturated conditions and they will be very useful for cleaning those organic residues from the water. It's a very cool system uh, and uh, has been implemented in many countries in large scales and also in small scales. In, in Brazil, in northeast of Brazil, in semi-arid regions, 
uh, where people were just uh, wasting their water and letting it infiltrate on their backyards. Uh, a, a, a huge program for technical assistance for small farmers called Don Elder Camera uh, Project. They implemented hundreds of small vermifilters. And these vermifilters were uh, collecting the water from, from the kitchen and toilets, uh, uh, sinks. And uh, this water was going through the filter and cleaning the waters for use in small um, gardens. And also the filter would produce uh, the compost, the vermicompost uh, and worms for uh, the garden. Yeah? So it was a, it's a very cool system. And I encourage you to Google and study a little bit more about this if you want. But for the purpose of these courses, I will just mention that it exists and it's a, it's a very fine uh, um, technology. It's very good, recommended. So just uh, before ending, there's a lot of online resources. Uh, uh, I really appreciate all the material that's put online by uh, Rhonda from NC State uh, uh, and uh, Facebook. There are so many groups in Facebook, which will not give you a lot of uh, technical information, but the, the shared experiences from uh, Vermicompost online is very useful. So if it's this community building, this community uh, sharing, it's very cool. Facebook provides a very good environment for this. There are quite a lot of uh, composting and vermicomposting YouTubers. For example, uh, I really like uh, AV uh, channel for the warm time lapses, uh, grow your greens for, there's quite good evaluations of uh, vermicomposting systems and growing your greens also. And there is a channel which is inactive now, but also very, very nice for home, com home uh, warm composting, which is the crazy warm lady. So I recommend those if you want. And there are some links here for other composting uh, online. And there are quite a lot of bloggers, uh, quite a lot of um, small companies uh, of, uh, that use uh, uh, vermiculture. And you will find a lot of information online. This is a, a quite huge community worldwide. And it's a tight community also. People are very kind and uh, really recommend you searching online and joining these groups and uh, following up these YouTube channels. This is very cool. Thank you very much. This is all I had to bring for you today.